So this part of the lecture is about the Entro crypto system. So Entro goes back to the 1990s. It's also very early in the history of letter space cryptography. And this comes uh, more from mathematics, so from um, Hofstein, Piper, and Silverman. The preprint is 1990, uh, 1996. There is a publication of it in 1998. A um, little bit funny history in that the paper got published after somebody already published a tech on an earlier version. That happens when you uh, circulate preprints and then, well, of course, it's also good that the original version, the well, original, the full published version doesn't get broken. They started with a publication saying, okay, well, we're looking for alternatives for RSA and ECC. So this was not seen as something uh, post-quantum. Post-quantum cryptography as a term didn't exist until 2003. And so this was just seen as something which, well, maybe could outpace ECC and RSA or could be better in something. So it has larger key sizes and ciphertext, but it could be faster than those. Now, also that goes back into some computational, into some dark ages for computations. So, well, maybe this was the feeling that nowadays elliptic curves are hard to beat with RSA. Back then, RSA was even still faster. Lattices do have some speed advantages, so that has turned out pretty right. There has been a good amount of research uh, in attacks, as I mentioned already, they got broken before they even got published. The signature scheme had a lot of uh, attacks. Well, we have just seen the GGH crypto signature system, so also their signatures uh, gave away some information. And similarly for Entro, the signatures didn't work out well. The encryption system, apart from the very first parameters of the preprint, has held up very fine after this exchange of parameters. However, there has been less uh, research over the time for secure implementations or secure usage of it because um, the designers took out a patent and many people were like, yeah, well, nobody will actually use something as long as it's patented, but that has expired now and Entro is actually one of the candidates in the NIST competition. And nowadays people do experiment with this. There were even a, a big Google and Cloudflare experiment which used Entro. If you want to follow along and do some computations yourself or after this video, sit in exercises and try to do this, um, lettucehacks.cl.yp.to is from a, pay, uh, from a talk that we gave at 34C3 together with Nadia Hellinger and Dan Bernstein. And so for that one, we have a whole bunch of Sage snippets so that you can just, well, click on the Entry tab there and then do some encryption, do some attacks. So how does it work? Well, actual works with polynomials over integers. Um, there's some parameter, well, pretty large range of parameters. So we have the cyclotermic polynomial, or the, the nth roots of unity are the roots of this polynomial, and this n is between 250 and 2500. We will also later on have some more parameters, but so far, let's just look at this n. And then, well, addition in polynomials, well, you just add component wise. Multiplication, well, then you have to multiply this degree at most n minus 1 polynomials, but also reduce model this x to the n minus 1. And as far as reductions model polynomials of degree n goes, this is the nicest we can get. So let's look at how this multiplication works. Let's focus on the last coefficient here, the one in front of the x to the n minus 1. Okay, so which pairs of coefficients can give an x, uh, an x to the n minus 1. So we can have a 0, which comes with, well, x to 0, and we can have a b n minus 1, which comes to an x to the n minus 1. So that is one extreme, and on the other extreme we have, well, the a n minus 1, b 0, and then every pair in between. So really going from the smallest index on a and the largest index on the b towards each other. And that's what we see down in here. So the indices always sum up to n minus 1. But if you now want to get um, what is the coefficient of x, well, then we're only getting a0 times b1 plus a1 times b0. However, we can also get to x after reduction. And now the way that we get to x after reduction is, well, it must have been to uh, x to the n plus 1 because well, we're taking modulo n minus 1, and so if you see an x plus 1, then the x to the n turns into 1, and then we're just left with x. And so that's what we see on these pairs here, 
these indices sum up to n plus 1. And then for the well, constant term, well, we have one constant term before reduction, a0, b0, and then these all come from degree n, where x to the n turns into 1. So this operation, I mean, we mathematicians understand that this is just this ring r there, but you can also just describe this on paper saying, hey, well, this is now how we combine polynomials, and it's typically called the cyclic convolution. So it's a product and has a special form that each coefficient has n terms such that the indices for each term sum up to the power of the x modulo n. So here everything sums up to 0 mod n, here everything to x that to 1 plus uh, modulo n, and here everything to n minus 1 modulo n. Other parameters in n true. So there is some integer q, which is, well, in the original n true is typically a power of 2, and then there is a 3 running around, which could also be a parameter, but it's typically just chosen to be a 3. And so q's most important feature is that it's not a multiple of 3. And so sometimes we work in the ring, which, well, if we need it, we have a letter for it, r sub q, which means we're taking the coefficients of the polynomials and reducing them modulo q. And we also might encounter an r sub 3, which just means we're taking this polynomial of the integers and then reducing each coefficient modulo 3. All right, so then how does this work? What is the public key? What is the private key? So in order to generate the private key, we're starting with two polynomials of degree at most n minus 1, and we want to have those with a very restricted set of coefficients. So first of all, the coefficients are only in 0 plus minus 1, and we want to have that most of the coefficients are 0. There's a strict conditions of how many 1s and minus 1s can appear. Um, when you look through this, so f has t coefficients equal to plus 1, and t minus 1 coefficients equal to minus 1. Whereas for g, oops, that should be a t here, sorry for the typo. So for g, everything is balanced. It has as many plus 1 coefficients as minus 1 coefficients. So these are, well, we call these sparse polynomials or small polynomials. They're small in the height, so there's no large coefficients. And then they have a small Euclidean norm if you take the coefficients as a, as a vector. Now the public key then will be something large. The public key is such that when you take this public key h multiply by f, you're getting 3 times g mod q. Well, how do we compute this thing? This means we're having that h is 3g divided by f. Okay, so we're doing this computation here modulo q in this ring. Now f need not be invertible. We're already doing one change, uh, one fix here, so while well, having t coefficients equals to 1, t minus 1 coefficients equal to minus 1 means that f of 1 is not 0. I mean, if both of them would be equally many, then you evaluate it at 1 and you get a 0. So that wouldn't be good because, well, x minus 1 is the root of this thing, so f would never be invertible. Otherwise, well, f has a good chance at being invertible, so try. If it doesn't work, you pick a new f. Then we have another part of the private key, so we know the f and the g, and then what we also remember is, well, f, and we remember some f sub 3, which is the inverse of f modulo 3. So it's again in this polynomial ring, but then instead of modulo q, we're computing modulo 3. You still with me? Okay, so h is a fraction of small polynomials, but itself will have large coefficients. Now, there is a mod q running around, so that means that the coefficients of h cannot be larger than q, but q is reasonably large, so h has a big norm, whereas f and g have a small norm. Okay, so now that we know how we get this public key, that's just h, and the private key, which is f and f3, we can now encrypt and decrypt. Okay, so the encryption. And again, warning, this is the schoolbook version. Things can go wrong and typically do go wrong the way that, well, things are when you have a schoolbook version. But this is good enough for us to understand what the mathematical problems are. And then, similar with other crypto systems, we have to watch out. 
So we're picking some more polynomials here. So there's going to be a polynomial R, which is a random polynomial. And that one again has similar conditions to G. Almost all of the coefficients are zero. And then there are T of them, which are plus one, and T of them, which are minus one. And then we're taking this random polynomial R, which is small, multiplying it by the large polynomial H, which is big. And okay, that gets some random large polynomial, reduced mod Q. And then we're adding the message to it. Now the message is a polynomial in R um, with reduced coefficients, but there is no limit on the number of non-zero coefficients. So this can be just a normal ternary encoding of the message. So you represent your message in base three using coefficients minus one, one, and one, and minus one, zero, and one. And then, well, starting with x to zero, x to the one, and so on, of degree at most, and minus one. And then this is your ciphertext. So this m adds a small change to some large polynomial. And then, well, this is the ciphertext you sent. Now the user, let's call it Alice, who has her secret polynomials, so she knows f and she knows f3. Let's see how she can compute the message back. So she's getting the c, and well, the c was reduced modulo q, so it's an element of r sub q. And then her decryption works in several stages. So the first step is still computing modulo q. She's taking the c, multiplies by her secret polynomial f. Okay, this is already something that only she can do. Let's look what happens there. So she then has f times r times h. Well, let's look at what the definition was. Ah, h times f is 3g. So we can replace this part by 3g. And then there's still f times f. And this was, yeah, this was mod m, so we can put the, sorry, mod q, and so we can compute this mod q. Then there's one step, well, I haven't actually told you how I want to re represent my elements mod q. I could use representation from 0 to plus q. Or what I actually want to do here is I want to have it centered around 0, so I go from minus q over 2 to plus q over 2. So these are integers. If q is a power of 2, and else I would be doing something appropriate with rounding. OK, so now I have my coefficients of a fixed in this interval. And then, well, if everything is small enough, this star should be just a plus a times. Sorry for that. So this is the same expression as up here. If everything is small enough, we're now computing mod 3. So the module 3 nukes this 3 times g times r. So then if we're computing mod 3, we're only left with f times m in our a. And then, well, we want to get rid of this f. And that's why we had this f3, which was the inverse of f modulo 3. OK, so we're taking this a, which we computed here, modulo 3 and multiplying by f3. And well, those cancel out. We're just left with a message. OK, your mom probably told you at some point, if it wasn't your mom, it was your math teacher, that you should not mix computing modulo something with something else. You can compute modulo 12 and then modulo 3 or anything else where the first modulus is a multiple of the second modulus. But if you're reducing modulo co-prime numbers, you can get totally different answers. For instance, here, if you take 11 first mod 3, well, you left with, well, 9 was the closest multiple, so you left with 2, then reducing mod 2, you're getting 0. If you first reduce mod 2, well, you left with 2. Uh, if you reduce mod 2, you left with 1, which is still 1 after reduction mod 3. So reducing first mod q and then mod 3, this does not sound like something which is proper mathematically. So how does this decryption work? I mean, here, that much is, is fine. Our A is, in fact, this thing here, modulo Q. But what I did in the next step, I canceled this 3 here by computing modulo 3. But it's a 3 mod Q, which well, doesn't necessarily have a 3. 
there's one exception, namely, if this reduction mod Q doesn't actually appear, if this is actually holding over the integers. So if everything is small enough, so if everything is small enough, then compared to Q, then we really have a times three sitting around here. And well, then reduction mod three removes this part, left us with F times M, we can multiply by F3 and we get M. Oops, another typo, this D should be T, that was the parameter of, oh no, this is actually 2T. So I have T plus ones and I have T minus ones, uh, T minus one minus ones. So D is in this case 2T minus one. So whatever number of non-zero coefficients in F and in R, then, well, this one will have at most three or often that coefficient here, and then the product here, so that will have at, at most d non-zero terms. And this one here, well, the m is dense, but the f also has a limit of at most d non-zero coefficients, so that product will, each coefficient will at most be d itself. And that is assuming that all the plus ones and minus ones play nicely so that you don't get a cancellation of stuff. So the largest it possibly can get is on the scale of 3d plus d. Now, if well, this has actually 2t, this one has 2t minus 1. Let's be generous in general and call this 2t. So in general, we want to have that 8t is less than q. Actually, not just less than q, it has to be less than q minus 1 because that's the range that I'm going The early entry parameters, basically everything until 2015 or 16, actually was a little bit more sloppy and said, yeah, okay, well, this would guarantee proper decryption, but it's so unlikely to happen, we can have a little bit of slack there. Nowadays, also because decryption failures give rise to attacks, we are generally concerned about this. And so nowadays, all parameters choose large enough Q well, of course, large enough end to make, make it hard, um, so that decryption does work. So, well, you can update your knowledge and know that under certain conditions, it's safe to reduce modular Q and modular 3, even though they're co-prime, namely if the reduction modular Q doesn't actually appear, because, well, it's small enough, it's an integer. So the other thing you might wonder about is what does it have to do in a lecture on lattices? So how can we see Andrew as a lattice based crypto system? Well, the typical answer to this is well, we can use lattices to attack it. Well, how we can use lattices to attack it? We do know the public key and we know that the public key satisfies this equation. Where f and g are both small. Now, here's a lattice basis that we can write out. So, well, these are the identity matrices. So, n by n identity matrices. Q is just the modulus up here. And then H is the matrix that you get. Well, it's a coefficient of the matrix that you get when you multiply by polynomials. So, it corresponds to this cyclic convolution that we have. So, it is an n by n matrix. And if you multiply, by the coefficient vector of a matrix, uh, of, a vector, of a polynomial, um, it shifts things in the right position, such that it always gets the, well, AI, BI, with the uh, AI, BJ, with the AI, that with I plus J, congruent to the right, um, or congruent to 0, 1, 2, 3, till n minus 1, 1 n. So that's the definition of this H here. And then, um, well, note that I put E over 3 here, else you have to put this 3 somewhere else. And then let's look what vectors we find in this lattice. So a matrix, well, we know already gives you a lattice. And so here, if we take the vector, which is just 1 and then all zeros, and 3 then all zeros, means that, well, we have Q and we have H times 3 in there. Nothing interesting. However, with these vectors, we also have a short vector in there. 
namely, well, there must exist from the reduction. We know that h times f is 3g mod q, so it means h times f is some extra multiple, some polynomial multiple of q more than 3g. And so when we multiply b by this k, which comes from there here, and f, we don't know these, that secret. I mean, we don't know f. And if we knew f, then we would find k. But f and k exist. And then we get, let's follow this calculation. So k gets multiplied by q. Aha, uh -huh, that's nice because we want k times q. And f gets multiplied by h. Aha, uh -huh, that's also nice. Well, there's a divided by 3. Now, f times h divided by 3 is g plus k times q. Yep, that matches exactly here. And then there we have the f again. So that means that g and f are actually in this lattice. And I realized I should have put a minus somewhere and I failed to do that. Well, I want to have that, the, um, that this answer here is exactly g. Now we should have h times f minuses, so there should be a minus one over here, so it's a minus k there. And that gives us g and f. So g and f are a vector in the lattice, and they're relatively short just because it's just so few plus ones and minus ones. Now, when you run LL on it, this shouldn't work. It did actually work for the very first lattices. So for the first parameters of Entro, this was an attack because they had seen a different lattice behind it and they didn't see this lattice. But once you scale things up, then, well, nowadays Entro, you can't break this LL. Interesting enough, you don't actually need to find the exactly correct G, F. If you have something which is a reasonably short vector, well, of course, ideally the right thing, but also something which is reasonably short will work just the same in the decryptions because all we're using is that f is small. Remember, there was this multiplication by f where decryption works if a fits actually into the box. Okay, so this is how Entro works and also how we can see it as a lattice-based system and then we, can, then we can use the normal machinery of lattice attacks to break it. So we're getting a lattice of dimension 2n where n is this parameter in the polynomial.